I'm almost ashamed to admit this, but I have only seen the movie Princess Bride one time. And uh, the first time I saw it was only a couple of years ago, actually, um, uh, with Kent and Denise and Cora and stuff. But the title of today's message is Inconceivable. <laughs> And of course, if you know the movie, right after that, the guy says, I, you keep using that word, I don't think you know what it means. Uh, and he says it again. But today we're going to read a story that seems inconceivable in the truest sense of the word. Um, and a fun aspect of becoming a parent uh, is sending out birth announcements. I think when Cora was born... Uh, I ordered, and I say I because Lindsay would have told me no, but I ordered 400 birth announcements to send out. Uh, anybody I had ever said hi to got a birth announcement for Cora. If I had their address or if I could find it, they got one. Um, if I knew where they work, I sent it to where they worked, uh, just because we loved uh, announcing uh, the birth of our child. The couple is usually tired and exhausted, but there's this good kind of proud that wants to let the world know that you had a baby. Uh, when Isley came around, uh, she got short. You can go downstairs, sweetie. I just said your name, but you're good. Um, we only ordered 100 for her. Uh, but uh, anyway, what we're going to read today, this is considered the most significant birth announcement the world has ever known. We're going to see in this passage, and we're going to meet a young girl um, who's a virgin. Her name's Mary, and she has a special visit from Gabriel, uh, and she learns some good news. Mary would have been a pretty young teenager at this time, anywhere from 13 to 16 years old, and she's going to display incredible faith. And so let's look at today's passage. If you brought your Bibles, get them out, turn them on if they're electronic, get on over to Luke chapter 1. It is on the front page of the notes I gave you, and it will be on the screen as well. Uh, and we're just going to kind of walk through this passage. It's one that's fairly familiar, often read around Christmas time. But in verse 26 of Luke chapter 1, it says this. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. We saw last week how the angel Gabriel showed up to Zechariah at the temple and announced the birth of, 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 or the pending birth of his son, John, who would become John the Baptist. Well, here, six months later, Gabriel shows up again. And, and remember, it had been 400 years before the nation of Israel had, had a word from the Lord. And now all of a sudden, there's an angel that showed up six months apart. So there's some special stuff going on here. And so we want to pay attention to this. But he, he shows up now to a young woman instead of an old man. And he shows up in Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Now remember, the gospel writer Luke, he's writing a story. He's a true story about Jesus. And, and he, he's... Anytime there's a detail that's included, it's important. And so he not only gives us the name of the town, but he shares where it is. And that's for people who may not be familiar with the geography of that area. <clears throat> and for this story, it's pretty amazing because Nazareth was not considered a very nice place to be from. In fact, when, when, uh, when Nathaniel was first introduced to, to this Jesus of Nazareth, we see in John chapter 1, he says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? And Philip says, come and see. And so today I want to issue that ish, uh, invitation as well to come and see what good can come from, Gal from Nazareth in Galilee. This, so the angel Gabriel shows up to a virgin and never in the history of the world had any woman had a child while she remained a virgin. I don't have time to go into the birds and the bees with you guys, but I think most of you know how it works. But this would be the first and the last time in history that such an event would take place, that a virgin would give birth to a son. And this virgin Mary was pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. 
This idea of being pledged to be married, a Jewish marriage would, would occur in three different stages. The first would kind of be an engagement where the two fathers would get together and they would agree that my son should marry your daughter. Here's the bride price. Uh, and it doesn't sound very romantic, does it? That the, the, the man and the woman wouldn't have a say in it. It's very different from what you and I experience today. So that would be the engagement. And then there would be a period of time called uh, the betrothal where they would have a ceremony. They would make mutual promises to one another. But at this time, they still wouldn't live together. They would live separately. So they would not consummate the marriage. And the only way that this betrothal could end would be in divorce. So it's not a casual promise. And then about a year later, so they wanted to make sure that, that the, the woman was not pregnant, among other things. There would be a marriage, and the, the, the marriage would la the, the ceremony would last seven days, and it would occur about a year after the betrothal. So this is, this is in that time period where, where Joseph and Mary had been engaged, their fathers had agreed on something, and then they had been betrothed. So they had a little ceremony, not living together, and all of that. So she was still a virgin, and the angel shows up and gives her some news. But Mary here, her name means exalted ones. And I want to be very careful because we live in a world that there's kind of two extremes when it comes to the talking about Mary. One is, is where Mary is magnified so much that Jesus almost becomes second place. That's one extreme. And the other extreme is, is where we, we don't give her any attention at all. And she's kind of relegated to just a name in the Bible. We don't give her the esteem that she deserves. And how we got to this place is interesting. I, I, I went down a pretty big rabbit hole with Roman Catholic theology and stuff this week. But the Roman Catholic Church has not helped the situation. Um, and I know we have some folks in this room who, who came out of the Catholic Church. And so I want to be very careful with what I say here. But there have been some unbiblical doctrines when it comes to the teaching regarding Mary that the, the Catholic Church has proposed. One of them is called the Immaculate Conception. That's the notion that Mary was born without a fallen sin nature and free from original sin. That's not true. That's not in the Bible. Another unbiblical doctrine is this idea of perpetual virginity that insists Mary remained a virgin her entire life. Once again, not true because Jesus had brothers and sisters. And the last one, the unbiblical doctrine, is that there was a bodily assumption. That's the belief that Mary never died, that she was taken directly into heaven. Once again, not supported by Scripture. And it got to the point where some folks in the Roman Catholic Church now regard Mary as a co-mediator alongside Jesus Christ. That Mary helps save people. So once again, we want to avoid the two extremes. So we don't want to go there, but we also don't want to diminish the role that Mary had in the life of Jesus and in the life of our faith. Because it says, greetings, the angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. Interestingly enough that that verse, that, that word that's used there to describe Mary as being highly favored, it's only used twice in Scripture. Do you know the other time that it's used? In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. To the praise of His glorious grace, which He has freely given us in the one He loves. You who are highly favored. Same word, speaking of Mary, is talking about you as a follower of Jesus. How cool is that? You who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. That's another promise that was made to Mary that's promised to us. And in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, Jesus says, Surely I am with you always to the end of the age. And what a way to be greeted, huh? Remember how Zechariah responded? He trembled in fear, didn't he? He got scared. Mary is no different. Verse 29, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Whew. 
That wasn't on the birth announcement that Lindsay and I sent out about our girls. Can you imagine that? Being told that here you are, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, and the angel Gabriel stands in front of you and tells you that this is going to happen? Whoa. I mean, that's just... We read that, and sometimes we gloss over it because we're used to the Christmas story, but it just happened. Like, this is amazing. And there's another fear response, and once again, the angel says, don't be afraid. And then there's kind of six predictions regarding Jesus. Because Mary has found favor with God, the, the angel says, you will conceive and give birth to a son. That happened. You are to call him Jesus. That happened. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Those three promises happened the first time Jesus came around. But then we get to the second half of this and we're like, well, this hasn't quite happened yet. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. That's future. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. That's future. And his kingdom will never end. That's also future. Interestingly enough, when, when Gabriel said, you will call him Jesus, there's only six people, this will make the seventh person, but six people up until this point that have been named before their birth. Isaac, Ishmael, Moses, Solomon, Josiah, John the Baptist, and Jesus. So Gabriel named seven, or two out of the seven. I found that interesting. But Jesus' name means Yahweh saves, God saves, God is salvation. And Gabriel told Mary that her son will be great. Remember what the, the Gabriel said about John the Baptist? You'll be great in what? In the sight of the Lord. There's no modifier here. Your son will be great. Your son will be great. That is a huge understatement. Right? We could have said extraordinary, splendid, magnificent, noble, distinguished, powerful, eminent. All of those would be inadequate. It's hard to do justice in the English language to the majestic, glorious person of Jesus Christ. So it's just simply, your son will be great. Jesus' greatness is unqualified. He is great in and of himself. His greatness is intrinsic to his very nature as God. It's not derived from any sources outside of himself. In fact, in Ephesians 1, this is what it says about Jesus. Jesus is far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked not only in the present age, but in the one to come. Christ is far above. Woo, yes. Whew. This was told to Mary before Jesus was even born. That's why there's that Christmas song, Mary, Did You Know? Not a fan. It's a catchy tune. But it's not true. She knew. Jesus came to earth to be the Savior of the world. He also came to fulfill the promises God made to the Jewish nation. And today, Jesus is enthroned in heaven but not on David's throne. One day Jesus will return and establish his righteous kingdom on earth and the rest of those promises will be fulfilled. And so imagine that Gabriel just said this to you, right? And Mary, young woman, still a virgin, asks, how will this be in verse 34? Since I am a virgin. Mary's question is logical, right? She asked the same question that Zachariah asked in verse 18, but his question was asked in skeptical unbelief. We're going to see her question was asked in wonder-filled faith. You see, the birth of Jesus to a virgin is a miracle that many people find it difficult to believe. And a lot of people try to explain away this concept, but it's unique from other ancient sources. There's no precedent in Jewish or pagan stories but Jesus would be conceived without sexual activity between a man and a woman. He would be conceived by God's power. And that was never imagined until it happened, which is how, another way that you and I can know that it's true. Stuff is not made up. 
The virgin birth is important to the Christian faith because Jesus Christ, God's Son, had to be free from the sinful nature that was passed on to other human beings by Adam. Because Jesus was born of a woman, he was a human being. But as the Son of God, Jesus was born without any trace of human sin. Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. Anybody want to try to explain that real quick? There's some mystery to our faith. And this is one of them. Because Jesus lived as a man, we know that he fully understands our experiences and our struggles. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way that we were, yet was without sin. And so when we cry out to God, but God, you don't understand. Yeah, he does. He gets it. But Jesus is also God. He has the power and authority to deliver us from sin. People can tell Jesus, we can tell Jesus all of our thoughts, all of our feelings, all of our needs, because he's been where we are and he has the ability to help. But we must be careful not to explain that Jesus was sinless simply because he didn't have a human father. That would mean Mary would have had to been sinless as well, and she wasn't. Jesus' sinlessness rests not on his miraculous birth to a virgin, but on the basis of his position with God. Through the birth of Jesus, God himself entered the world in human form. That is a miracle. Are you sure, Jeff, that we can't sing Christmas music? Like, this just... No! <sighs> All right. I may try to sneak one in. Joy to the world, I think we should sing year-round. So, anyway... Verse 35, the angel answered. So in response to Mary's question, how can this be since I'm in a virgin? Since I'm a virgin, the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come on you. Power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. She, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. This overshadowing cloud was a visible manifestation of God's glory, that God's presence was there. So that power of God was seen by Moses in the old, and others in the Old Testament. It shows up again at Jesus' transfiguration, but now it's going to do a unique work in the life of Mary. And see here, Gabriel affirms the deity and the humanity of Jesus. As Mary's son, he would be a human, but as a son of the Most High God, he would be the son of God. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, that's his humanity, and unto us a son is given, that's his deity. There's another Christmas song there. And then verse 37, For no word from God will ever fail. That's the basis of the first song that we sang today, Your word never fails. Some of the other translations say, for with God nothing shall be impossible. There's nothing impossible with God when he is determined to do it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to do every impossible thing that we ask of him. A lot of people use that verse or the older verse in the King James, for with God nothing shall be impossible. They use that as a cliche to cover up the fact that they want their own selfish desires. Remember what we talked about last week? That is, if we serve God in order to get something, we're not really serving Him, we're serving ourselves. Anything God determines to do, He can accomplish. His word never fails. That doesn't mean He's going to do everything that we want Him to do, because some things that we ask are not included in His plan. But it helps us put in proper perspective the things of God. No word of God will ever fail. That's how you and I can be assured of everything contained within here. Everything that Jesus said and did is true, right, and happened. Everything that's going to happen according to the word of God is going to happen. We may not understand how. A lot of people are still confused about Revelation, right? But in the end, we know that we win. We know that God wins. We know that his kingdom will come. His perfect and righteous and holy kingdom. 
and we know that and we live in hope of that because of what God's word says. So Mary asked one question, how will this be since I am a virgin? And Gabriel simply says, power of the Most High will overshadow you. It's the power of God. She doesn't go on to say, can you explain that just a little bit more? I'm confused. I'm young. I, there's going to be a lot of questions. There's going to be a lot of stuff that might happen in my life. We see later on that, that Joseph actually plans to divorce her because of this. The angel has to show back up and say, don't do it, right? But her response is one that, that I want to be a desire of my heart. And that's verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. What a statement of faith. Mary might have had some concerns. The neighbors may have said something about her. Her family might have been outraged. Joseph was probably a little concerned as well. The local rabbi and other authorities may have had a lot of questions. To have a child out of wedlock in those days was a very serious matter, but Mary gave a response of faith. But she is the Lord's servant. She surrendered herself to the Lord. That word servant is, is where we get the word slave, bond servant, bond slave. It's a voluntary surrender to the other person. Mary experienced here the grace of God and believed the word of God so she could be used by the Spirit to accomplish the will of God. In today's society, when a woman gets pregnant out of wedlock, sometimes the men don't stick around. And oftentimes, the woman ends up in poverty. Their lives are doubly hard, and that's why you and I, as followers of Jesus, as brothers and sisters, we must care for women and children. Even if it breaks us, we must never forsake single parents. She faced all of this with faith. Whatever your will, let it be done for me. Like Mary, we can't truly be servants of Christ unless we accept his plan for our lives. This was God's plan for Mary, and Mary said, I'm in. Sometimes God reveals part of his plan for us, and we ask him, can you change that a little bit? Can you do this a little differently? God, I really want to be a pastor, but please don't send me to Colorado. God, I really want 12 kids. Lindsay knows I want 12 kids, by the way. <laughs> But God's plan is different. We need to submit to his plan. If he is Lord and we are his servants, we must be glad servants of his. That's how faith applies to grace. When God promises you a savior, you say, let me have him. When God announces his plan for your life, say, amen, let it be not my will, but your will be done. And the reason we say that to God is because of who he is and what he's done and what he will do. It's interesting. Do you know what the punishment for Mary for getting pregnant out of wedlock should have been? She should have been stoned. That's what the law says. Stoning. Which makes this next part of the story inconceivable. Because it would have been a priest that would have declared her guilty. A priest would have led her out of town for the town to stone her. But Mary doesn't hide. Who does Mary run to? She runs to a priestly family. I'd never considered that before this week. That Mary ran to the very people that should have stoned her. 
Verse 39, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home. Zachariah was a priest and greeted Elizabeth. Whew. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. The house of an ordained priest was the last place Mary should have gone. But because Elizabeth was a relative, which makes the interaction between Jesus and John all the more interesting throughout the Gospels, because they're related. It's the last place she should have gone, but her heart, because Gabriel said, your, your relative Elizabeth is pregnant, she's six months along, go see her. She went. And then we have, quite possibly, some of the most fascinating, inconceivable words that John's first testimony to Jesus, remember John the Baptist, predicted before he was going to proclaim the coming of the Lord, the first response to hearing Mary's voice was John proclaiming the king in his mother's womb. Whew. And unfortunately, when somebody talks about the unborn baby in the womb, Immediately, we, there's some angst within us because of the political climate that we live in today. This passage affirms the personhood of babies who are not yet born. This is also an incredibly difficult topic. If you've ever been around someone or perhaps you have had an abortion, the church has used this passage to beat you down and beat you up. And if that has happened to you because of the church, I would like to apologize not excusing what happened, what you did, or what you've seen, but because God's grace was not portrayed in a loving way to you. And you and I, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a responsibility to be gracious and loving and kind to every single person who's made in the image of God, regardless of what has happened in their past. Does our heart break for the 50 million plus kids that have been aborted? Absolutely. But we need to be more gracious. We need to be more loving. We need to be more supportive. And we need to advocate not just for the personhood of the baby in the womb, but for the personhood of every single person who's made in the image of God. That's old people, that's young people, that's everybody. If we are going to be people of life, we need to be people of life from conception to death. This passage teaches us that we must learn how to adjust to circumstances beyond our control. Regardless of our circumstances, whether unpleasant or enjoyable, God is in control. And that's why I love that hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full in His Wonderful Face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. God is wonderful. He is. He is amazing. So in light of 
this inconceivable birth announcement and this inconceivable response of faith of Mary, what are you and I to do? First of all, I want us to take God at his word. Take God at his word. Mary was young, she was poor, she was a female. All characteristics that to people of her day would make her seem unusable by God for any major task. But God chose Mary for one of the most important acts of obedience he's ever demanded from anyone. So I want you to take God at his word. You may feel that your ability, experience, or education makes you an unlikely candidate for God's service. Don't limit God's choices. He can use you if you trust him. So take him at his word. So the first one is take God at his word. The second one is trust and obey. She believed the angel's words and agreed to bear the child, even under humanly impossible circumstances, even when difficult social circumstances. A young, unmarried girl who became pregnant risked disaster because unless the father of the child agreed to marry her, she would remain unmarried for life. If her own father rejected her, she could be forced into begging for a living or prostitution in order to make a living. So she risked losing Joseph, her family, her reputation. And her story about being made pregnant by the Holy Spirit, we'd probably lock her in a loony bin. But Mary said, in spite of all of that, let it be with me according to your word. She didn't know all of the tremendous opportunities she would have. She took a risk of faith. She trusted and obeyed. She didn't consult with anyone. She didn't take time to weigh the pros and cons. She only knew what God was asking her to do, and that was to serve him. And she willingly obeyed him. We need that kind of trust and responsiveness in our life. God wants willing servants. And finally, Jesus is great. The Gospel of Luke, the entire Bible points to the Son of the Most High. Jesus defined greatness. So let's look to Him. Let's take a couple minutes at the table and let's talk through these questions. Can you remember a time when you found God's word or promise difficult to believe? And how did you express faith if you did and despite of the difficulty? What would it have been like to be Mary? That's one of my favorite exercises in scripture. Put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in Mary's shoe. What would it have been like to be her? Would you have responded in faith or why don't you go to the next house, right? Go see somebody else. I can put you in touch with somebody, but this is just too much for me. All right, so take a couple minutes. If you're new here, we do this table talk time. Uh, You can share as much or as little as you would like. Go. What would it have been like to be Mary? Do you think you would have responded the same way? I probably should have asked, what would it have liked to be Joseph? Oh, yes. And so what's interesting is Luke tells this story from the perspective of Mary. Matthew tells this story from the perspective of Joseph. So here's how Joseph responded in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged, or yeah, his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So Jesus had Mary, who was an example of faith. His adopted dad, Joseph, was an example of faith. And he was a son of the Most High. So we are going to add to our we are a people who, all right? The first week in the Gospel of Luke, we are a people who live in the certainty of God's word. Last week, we are a people who focus on the joy found in God's faithfulness. And this week, we are a people who take God at his unfailing word. Let's pray. Father God, your plan of redemption was advanced when one simple peasant girl said yes to you. A yes that would change the world. There was no complicated ritual, advanced theological training involved, just Mary's trusting words, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to, to me as you have said. Father, may it be the same in our lives. Help us cooperate with your plan for the world by saying yes to you. Even now, we say yes to you. Holy Spirit, may the life of Christ be manifested through us and in the needs of the world around us. Amen.